I think it's still taboo to say, look, I'm dyslexic. I think there are some impediments, internal impediments that for whatever reason preclude people from being as boisterous as I am about being dyslexic. I don't care who you are. I will tell you, I don't care if I'm in the White House or in a Fortune 500 company. I'm going to walk in there. I might use some improper grammar. I don't care about what you think about me because I'm acutely aware of who I am. Hello, and welcome to the Black and Dyslexic Podcast with Winifred A. Winston and Lederic Horn, the show that unapologetically focuses on helping Black and underrepresented minorities navigate the special education process. We want to help raise awareness in the Black and Brown community, remove the stigma about learning disabilities, and provide you access to professionals in the space of dyslexia and special education that you need to hear from. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Black and Dyslexic Podcast. I'm Winifred A. Winston. And I'm Ladera Horn. And today, I'm so excited, guys. We've got Dr. Herman Felton. Oh, I'm fanning out. Okay. (laughs) Dr. Herman Felton is the 17th president and CEO of Wiley College. He's one of the youngest presidents of an HBCU. He's also the co-founder of Higher Education Leadership Foundation. And Wiley College is located in Marshall, Texas. And guys, I'm just going to read out his credentials because we know as folks with dyslexia or learning disabilities, we often feel like educational attainment is like far beyond our reach. So Dr. Felton earned his bachelor's degree in political science from Edward Waters College in Jacksonville, Florida. He also earned his Juris Doctorate from the Levin College of Law at the University of Florida and completed graduate work at Jackson State University, where he earned the Doctor of Philosophy in Educational Administration and Supervision. So ain't no dyslexia holding him back. (laughs) (laughs) We're so excited. Welcome to the Black and Dyslexic Podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm so happy to be here. So... I initially said that I was fanning out. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the history of the podcast. I started out just doing Instagram hashtags, Mm -hmm. right? And I was doing celebrities at first. Then I started with athletes. And I thought, gosh, I need everyday people. I need folks that regular folks can identify with. And I started searching and scouring the web for Black folks. And I came across your profile. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's a president of a college and university. Like this is huge. And I featured you and I featured you a number of times. And then when I reached out on Instagram and you responded, I was like, he checks Instagram. (laughs) Yeah. You know, that's where the students live. They have my cell phone number, but they'd rather send messages on Twitter or, you know, uh, Facebook even some, not very many, but Instagram is a choice, the vehicle of choice. So I have to check the the DM for the students um, to be able to help them navigate through Wiley College. That is awesome. That is awesome. So can you just share your beginnings and your journey and with dyslexia and how you were able to make it through school? Yeah. So I learned in the second grade that, that something wasn't right. I'm a product of poverty, grew up in the inner city of Jacksonville, Florida, and my mom had uh, six kids, single mom, janitor, uh, worked two jobs, so really hard working, salt of the earth woman. And so you know what that means. Uh, There weren't necessarily resources for counseling, et cetera. But I knew in the second grade, I was, something was, was different, and I started avoiding Um, the reading assignments. I started avoiding being called. And I remember Ms. Harden actually giving me a referral because uh, of my insistence on using the bathroom. But it was actually my time to go to the board and do some work at the board. And I was not about to let the biggest secret uh, out for anybody. So fortunately for me, uh, I was in public school uh, and folk didn't have, um, I don't know if they had the agency. Um, I'm certainly not going to say they didn't care, but I don't think they had the agency to recognize that I was horrible in spelling, horrible in reading. Uh, I masked it um, in so many different ways. 
Um, and so, you know, I got through high school on a wing and a prayer. Didn't graduate, though. I didn't graduate from high school. I graduated while I was in the military. I got a GED. And the Marine Corps had this stipulation. Uh, I came in as a 12J. And it was, uh, the stipulation was, in order to stay in the Marine Corps, you had to have gotten your GD or high school diploma within your first year after all of your basic training and MOS training. So I remember being in Iwakuni, Japan, going to the learning center. And in the military overseas, you have these DOD spaces, you have these um, spaces with community colleges on the campus for continuing education. And I went to this place and went, walked in and said, I'm here to get my GED. And she said, sure, we can take care of that. Let's take care of this uh, placement test to see exactly where you're at. And for some reason, I felt comfortable. I just said to her, like, I have a problem with reading. And the world didn't come crashing down. Nobody made fun of me. And I was able to move on after that. Those were the things that I thought wouldn't happen once I let that secret out. And she said, well, what do you mean you can't read? I said, well, sometimes it's kind of hard to pronounce the words. I can see them, but sometimes the letters appear backwards. It's just, I I don't understand it. And she said, oh, baby, you're probably dyslexic. That was another big word that I did not understand, but she didn't seem to have a problem with it. Neither did I. So I took the little placement exam, um, did that, did well enough to actually get into the GD course, went through it, and she made me um, go see a counselor. I did. I was diagnosed. And then flashcards and reading, uh, exercises, videos, tracing stuff. I, I mean, it's just all kind of things that I, I, you know, I'm like, what is all of this stuff about? And uh, that's how I was diagnosed with dyslexia. And so fast forward, I get through the Marine Corps, really enjoyed it, had an insatiable appetite for learning once I figured out that I wasn't slow. Um, Because another gift that she gave me was that most folk with dyslexia um, are above average, average to above average in intelligence. And that was a whole nother world as well for me. So it made me think, yep, there's something different for me. I loved my time in the Marine Corps, did eight years, uh, and came across people with college degrees. Um, I hadn't where I grew up at. And I thought to myself, like, these people aren't smarter than I am. They're not all conjugating verbs all the time. You know, they how about speaking it? How about it? bad, bad <laughs> grammar. I, I might be able to do a little something. All right. I don't know. Um, but I, I got out and was working at the post office. And the, the day that changed my life, there was a young guy in some khakis and a polo. And I was in a postal uniform, a little dirty because we process mail. And he was going to get into a little 325i BMW. Nothing fancy, but he was clean. Went to work, clean, came out clean. That wasn't my thing. We went in clean, came out dirty. And I just looked at him and said, man, what do you do here? He said, uh, I'm in logistics. I'm like, logistics? How did you get that job? He said, well, I went to college and I was recruited. And so I heard college and started immediately trying to get into all the colleges in Jacksonville and only one would accept me. And that was Everett Waters College. Uh, It's Everett Waters University now, but it's Everett Waters College at the time. Uh, And they had this summer bridge program. You had to go through it and, you know, complete these courses. So you know, I worked full time at the post office and finished school in three years um, at Everett Waters, just grinding it out, man. So, um, you know, the dyslexia journey has been amazing for me, honestly. I wish I'd had the courage or the confidence to say something before, but I didn't. But, I, you know, I know things turned out the way they were supposed to, but I had no idea. And so I, I know I could not have been the only person in my space that grew up that way. Um, But uh, none of us were going to let on to uh, any type of deficiency growing up in those mean streets. So, 
So not finishing high school, was that a direct result of I'm not reading, I'm not understanding, you know what, I'm not yeah. coming back here? Yeah, I have um, in my office, none of my degrees, only my high school transcript. And it is class rankings 424 or 446. Um, it's a 1.29 GPA. And it's a litany of Fs, Ds, and Cs. And when I got to the 12th grade, it was really the 11th, twice, I was six credits short. And so, again, I um, got in a little trouble, and the Marine Corps was where I was introduced to. And so I had to go into that delayed entry program, that summer program, in order to stay out of the correctional facility. I had to enlist into the delayed entry program. And when the delayed entry program, uh, the time came around for me to graduate, I was six credits short. And fortunately, the Marine Corps had this program called 12J. I went to school every day, but, you know, uh, you can fake it, you know, for so long, you know, and uh, I was able to keep up, but just in a marginal way. Uh, but I always knew that I, I could do better, but it, there was still this dominant voice in my head, you know, you're a little slow. Um, it's okay. So, so the Marine Corps um, helped me out there. It's just a, I'm an amazing, amazing story. And uh, first, just thank you for your service, brother. Um, yeah. And, and then also, I'm curious, you know, I fly a lot and it, it is a lot, you know, it's, it's fairly often that I'm sitting at a, in a seat and there's someone in the armed service that'll be sitting next to me. Generally men, and we will start up a conversation. I'll ask what I'll do. And eventually I end up disclosing that I have dyslexia. And I would say 90% of the time, they will say either like, I'm dyslexic, I have ADHD, I was in special, like they will say yep. something along those lines. And I, I know that there are a lot of folks, you know, who, and I don't know if it's like, they need the structure, you know, that the military offers, or they, you know, life hasn't given them a lot of opportunities and the military feels like, you know, a really good channel for them. Um, I yeah, I don't know if I have a question, but it's more of an observation, just that I know that it yeah. ends up being, it, it ends up being a place where not only a lot of us end up, but it's also, I think mm -hmm. it, it tends to be a, a nurturing environment for some folks, oftentimes unlike what they'll experience in their- You know, you know experience. what, Lederic, like looking back on it now, Lederic, I can say that it was- probably ripe because of the structure and the many different types of learning that took place. Um, and so where you may have been weak in one area, you could be extremely strong in another. You know, when it came to history on the Marine Corps, the only thing that really I was devoutly um, interested in was the Montefiore Point Marines. Those were the Black Marines. That was part of the history. Like I know about the halls of Montezuma and 1775 and how we were born and all of this good stuff. But I absolutely like went in on that. So I think the history, which is how that was my entree into getting better, becoming a functioning, um, functioning dyslexic and then overcoming it best I could. It was because uh, Ms. Robin told me to find a book or a topic that I really liked to read, and that was Black history. And so, but the Marine Corps, I think in the other spaces, your day is regimented, like at least at the beginning, you, you don't have to think. And what a wonderful place to be in if you, you know, yes, yes, if sir. you're dyslexic <laughs> and you're, you're trying to figure it out, go, yes. go, uh, go, go run three miles. Yes, sir. Right. Um, you know, go, go learn how to do hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yes, sir. Go shoot the rifle. Yes, sir. And so I think it provides a space that has structure. And, you know, the most dyslexics that I know are highly, highly uh, retentive. They are, you know, they can laser focus in on one thing and do what they need to do to accomplish that. And so I think that's probably what you pick up uh, Ladere, really, yeah, I would gander to say that just about everybody who is and is in the military would would probably agree with that. Yeah, and the, you know the other thing is, Doctor Felton, the the challenges that I think so many of us have around 
executive functioning, you know? And so mm. it is that sort of that structuring of a day or how mm. to begin or in a task or breaking a very complicated task down into smaller pieces, which is something that, yeah. you know, I, I struggle with today. I used to, you know, I have a lot more structure in my life now, but um, kind of early on in my career, I would notice that I would always be the happiest when I would be traveling and be on the road. But that's because like mm. someone gave me an itinerary. And so it was yeah. very clear, like, you got to stay here. And this is what you're going to do. And this is what you're going to yeah. say. And, you know, it was all it was all that structure. And I'd be like, man, this feels great. And then I would get home and be like, I don't know what to do now, you know. And, yeah. um, and I've had to learn, like, I've got to imply a lot of rigid structure in my life in order to really, in, in, in a, on a level, just to feel okay, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm at my best. My wife is... Uh, a lot more structure as as it relates to a calendar than I am, and oh even goodness. though we, we got we got a lot in common, then brother. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah, I mean, all along the way, I have been, you know, sort of. It's going to be okay. It'll work out. It'll, you know, you can do this. I'm I'm going to do this. I know we're traveling on Friday. I'll make plans on Thursday. Like it's that bleeds into or has bled into my social life. But my professional life, I've had the benefit of having help of a schedule. So, um, again, allows me to really, if I don't, you know, I'll, I get a copy of the schedule in the morning and I don't worry about it anymore. You know, I get a copy of the schedule in the afternoon and I don't worry about it anymore. I'm often at the airport calling Cassandra and say, okay, so where am I staying at? Like, I mean, it it is because of the way in which I try to manage the day and manage the time, manage the focus, I do it. And I think it is not the best result. I've been able to have good results, but I'm juggling too many things. And I think that's a function of my comfort um, with the dyslexia, to be quite honest with you. Um, it is, it's weird how it's a comfort, uh, but also a, a fear you know, and get, get the same thing out of being structured or not too structured. Um, it's, it's weird. I, I have not been able to explain that or understand it, but I just really checked it off as it's just one of my special powers that I get from being dyslexic. Yes. Yes. Now you earned your bachelor's in three years. What did you do after the post office? Because you kept going to school, right? So yes. did you make that career <laughs> shift. Let me tell you this. This is a funniest story in the world. When I, my second year there, I was with another brother, Vladimir Monroe, who we're still good buddies now. He was in the Navy. He was a non-traditional student just like me. And we became active in student government and, and everything. And some of our mentors were out in the community. So we started this, this little mentoring club called the Delian League. And I got the name from the Western Humanities uh, course where learned about the Delian League who were preparing for the Persian army. And they taught their men and young men how to be fierce fathers, farmers, and, and fighters. And so I love the name, the Delian League. So it was all about mentoring young kids. And so we're really excited. We're going into our senior year and we come across Kimlin Neesmith, who's also um, an attorney by trade. And he was one of the professors and he called everybody scholar. Hey, scholar, how you doing? How you doing, scholar? So we're coming through the courtyard. And he's like, what are you scholars doing when you graduate? And I said, I'm going to get an MBA. Uh, we're going to take our mentoring group and make it a nonprofit and, and do this stuff. And Vladimir said, I'm going to law school. And so his next response was, have you took the uh, LSAT or the GMAT? And we looked at each other like, what's that? So he just put his head down. He didn't embarrass us. <laughs> he just pulled out a sticky and wrote a note and said, call this person at the University of Florida. So Vladimir calls Dr. Chandrea Williams, who is an admissions director. Vladimir is going down for an appointment. I'm going to go to JU to get an MBA. Law school wasn't even on the radar for me. Vladimir is going down and uh, he... Uh, had a flat tire. I was off, took him down there, sat in the uh, lobby. She came in, which one of you are Vladimir? He said, me. So I'm just there and just sitting. She said, you might as well come on in here too. So I went in, 
we sat down. She told us, look, you're at Everwaters. When the admissions folks see your school, there's not a lot of weight on your school. So your LSAT score needs to be high. You need to take a prep course. You need to have your letter in the first day the applications are open. You need to have your three references. You you have to have everything. And so we were like, oh, okay. So we left there, went and got into the uh, LSAT prep course, took the LSAT. I got into law school. He did. Wow. Get out of here. Wow. He went and got his MBA. <laughs> he did. He did not. He went to law school like maybe six or seven years later, but I had no idea. Uh, didn't, wasn't looking for it. And, uh, you know, God was in, in control uh, then. Uh, has been forever, but he was certainly, when I got accepted, I'm like, am I going to do with this? Uh, but it it all worked out. So I stumbled into law school. And while I had some great success there, um, I was very clear that I was going to be a Black college president the entire time I was there. So folks knew that and they laugh about it now to this day, like, God, man, I can't believe it. You said that that's what you're going to do. I'm like, yeah, I am. Um, it just felt like it was real, real. That conversation I had with Jesus was like for real. So um, I had been exclaiming it before I got to law school. And um, here I am. Which strategies did you use in law school? Because it is so much reading. The demand is like my, my cousin went to law school. She finished, you know, she's an attorney. And I just remember her being in school and, and she had a family changing and I remember telling her sometimes could you just talk English talk regular to me but she was like it's breaking me down and building me back up and it was yeah. demanding with the reading the research so how did you manage that I would read record myself and then listen to it all the time that was it for me um I was a big workout buff at the time and so I was you know walking running weightlifting and it was all about listening to the recordings and then they also had these extra books they called them mini con visor which was a condensed version of just about all the major courses torts contracts property and so they would have these cliff notes so i would get those and really really go in on those but it was the reading recording myself uh, I was looking at one of my um, recorders just the other day. Like, I'm not going to even cut that thing on. I'm scared to <laughs> scared to hear any of those uh, rules. Uh, but it was that was my way of uh, really getting through was reading, recording, and then flashcards. So you do you didn't sign up and get any accommodations through disability support services. I've never had that. Like, I just, I don't know if it's pride. Um, I don't know if it's the drive. I think it is, you know, I am my mother. And so the drive that she had, never saw her miss a day of work, never complained. I'm going to say that it was Janie Mae that just told me that I could do it. And the other piece was, you know, I didn't want, I'm already coming in as someone at a small private black college. So I got in because of affirmative action or this, that, the third. No, I did. My LSAT score was bomb. I went on a full scholarship. I had a 4.0 GPA from undergrad. So folk would, it was always interesting. And sometimes it happened more with us than it did with them. Never heard of uh, Everwaters. Well, <laughs> you have now. Right. Um, you know, so it, it was this uh, chip that, you know, I just couldn't bring myself to ask for a special accommodation. Never have. Got you. Got you. So what what made you how did you make the shift? Not what. How did you make the shift? If you knew you wanted to be a college president and you were working at the post office, you finished school. Now you went to law school. How did you make that pivot into higher ed? Well, law school. um, when I was, so I was the SGA president my last year in undergrad. And I remember leading a protest about food in the calf. If you went to a black college, you had a problem with the food in the calf at some point in time, right? Understanding nothing, thinking you know everything. Uh, and my president was not mean to me. He was really kind. 
And I brought shame to the institution uh, because I was talking about something that I knew nothing about. Um, and he used it as a teachable moment in that I said, I think I want to do what this man does. So then we're in a board meeting and there are, you know, 20 people, probably a little more board of trustee members encouraging him to increase the enrollment standards and decrease the open door admissions uh, allocation of students that came in. And they went one by one around the table and talked about why. And it was the most eloquent ass whipping that I had ever heard in my life. When he got up and married the mission of the college, our founders, what is owed to the then newly freed and enslaved to now, uh, the young, um, hopeful. Um, that's when I knew that that's exactly what I want to do right there. And so um, he told me to go to law school. And when I get out of law school, get into higher ed and learn how to raise money because you're going to need to do that if you want to be a president, you need to learn how to raise money. And I met the president of Murray State University playing basketball down at the University of Florida, King Alexander. And after about two semesters, he would come down every summer. His mother was a senior administrator at uh, the University of Florida. We got to know each other. And he's like, so what are you going to do when you graduate from law school? I said, I want to be a black college president. He said, well, I can't help you be a black college president, but I can expose you to what it means to be a president. And, and so he was at Murray State. And he said, uh, when you graduate, what, are you okay with moving to Murray, Kentucky? Am I? Yes. Went there, went into development. He made me teach. Um, and so I taught in the business law, criminal law, um, even taught some um, – master level programs. And, uh, but he gave me uh, the gift of uh, understanding development. And, um, and so after about three years, got a phone call from President Jenkins, who said, it's time to come home. And I left Murray State and went to Livingstone College to work as his um, special assistant at the time. And he said, we'll take our time, but I'm going to get you in and we'll we'll figure things out. Um, but I went in as his special assistant. The vice president for institutional advancement left after about eight months. Um, and I slid in and I did that for eight years. I went from special assistant to VP to senior vice president to chief operating officer. And I was appointed to Wilberforce University as their 21st president um, in 16 but it was only because of Jimmy Jenkins, President Jimmy Jenkins. He um, sparked something in me when I was an undergrad. He nurtured, he curated, um, and he served as a steward over both my soul and my career. Um, and he, he was um, the quintessential baby boomer. You know, I'm uh, not necessarily going to tell you I love you, but I'm going to put food in your belly, clothing on your back, shelter, he stretched me so much that um, I, when I left Livingstone, I was ready to run any institution that um, I think I could have, you could have put in front of me. He really, I owe him everything. Uh, and that's President Jimmy R. Jenkins Sr. Uh, he just retired last year from uh, Livingstone after serving some 35, 36 years, um, first at Elizabeth City, State University and Ever Waters and then Livingstone College. Wow. Like I, I graduated from uh, the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. So I went to high school in okay. North Carolina. So I'm very familiar yeah. with State Livingstone. Like, you know, all the colleges, you know, when you're in North Carolina. And I yeah. mean, the story, like I worked in higher ed. I worked in student affairs. I worked in career services. Mm -hmm. I got into higher ed with a bachelor's because I had business development experience. And that was mm -hmm. around the time yeah. when universities were saying, okay, uh, career centers, what are you doing, right? Um, students were looking at return on investment. And everyone said, oh, mm -hmm. you can get into higher ed without a master's or a terminal degree. So I was like, well, they don't know me. 
So I got in on an employer <laughs> development team to build relationships. But what you just laid out, like it's unreal. Like to tell yeah. you to get in there and make money, those positions aren't easy to get into. Being able to teach because you had a terminal degree, a bachelor's wouldn't allow you to be able to teach, but you had a That's terminal right. degree. Yep. Like this story, I'm I'm never speechless. Like literally, yeah. like <laughs> it couldn't have been a clearer path. Go yeah. into ed, teach, learn how to raise money because that is mm -hmm. essential. And institutional advancement, you just can't, you can't get in there. You 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 have to have experience. Yeah, oh, wow. like it, it was it was fascinating when he called me from Murray State. I was a director, and I jumped to the C suite, you know, as a special assistant, and then a VP. And I'd only been in higher ed for four years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, actually, it was it was only three years. Three that years. Sound, that is that is. Phenomenal it's, trajectory. It's, it's, it is. It is. And but you know, I had to work ten times harder than anyone else because of the appearance of favoritism. Like, hey, and he would tell me all the time, you know, excellence is a standard. I'm not gonna tell you that ever again. That's what he told me the first day. I'll never forget I wrote a briefing for him as to whether or not we should become a, Lune a Lenovo campus. That's when Lenovo had come out big, those, I and mean, we're in North Carolina, so the Chapel Hill is right up the road, and they're trying to make all their HBCUs think pad universities. So I came back and told him that with my legal training why we could and why we couldn't, and then what I thought we should do. And that memo I gave to him, got it back, and it had, it was bloody. It had red marks, underlining, you know, this, that, and the other in it. And I remember getting the paper and asking him, like, so do you want me to take another stab at it? He said, nope, that's okay. I'll see you tomorrow. So I went back to my office and cried because <laughs> I was like, Man, I I just wrote a senior paper at law school. I know I can write. Like I, this what the, this can't what, be that what, bad. Was it spelling, grammar? What what was it? Was it your argument? It, it was it was preference. It was his thoughts. And when I left, I learned that it was none of that. It was a quick punch in the solar plex to make me understand that if that paper wasn't on 10, everything that I submitted to him must be on 10. I think that's what you get with leaders who are baby boomers. They're unapologetic um, in the mission. There's no mission creep. They know what they need to do. This is how you're going to do it. And I don't necessarily feel, care about your feelings. I do a little bit, but we're going to get work done. As a leader now, um, there's so many factors you have to take into consideration when you're leading people. Um, but working for a baby boomer, I think, was one of the best uh, gifts um, ever gifted to me as well, because it was non-negotiable. It was 15 minutes before he got there. It was leave after him. It was yes, sir. No, sir. It was getting coffee. It was picking up grandkids. It was flying uh, across the country to vet something. It was getting uh, gifts for the college, it did not matter. Mm -hmm. Whatever the assignment was, he gave it to you and expected you to do it and expected you to think one or two steps ahead. Um, and so it was just a great training ground. And he is just, um, to me, the most prolific leader. And I've been in the Marine Corps. Um, he's the most prolific leader that I've ever had a chance to serve with. I was going to say it was sounds like the Marine Corps 2.0. Right? That's what I was thinking another, too. Yeah. Was like, we got a mission another, here, right? Yeah, Wait, without without camouflage. That's right. Without the camouflage or the rifle. That's exactly what it was. When you said special assistant, I was like, uh-oh, he done put him to work because yeah. you're you're seeing everything. Yeah. Everything 
that you're 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 the gatekeeper. You're hearing everything, even from staff, right? And in higher ed, I know from my experience, you got student affairs, then you have the academic side. Those are two different beasts, two different yep. planets, actually, right? And now they're yep. all buying, coming for the president because we need this. Because we need this, because I need to do my research over here. I need yeah. more money to do this research. And you're getting it yeah. from both sides. And then you're trying to serve the community that you're in, right? Yeah. And that was in live that was in North Carolina. Yep. In right? Salisbury. So, so so in North Carolina is a little different. Like that university, the community has an expectation, right? Yeah. In the South, it's different in higher ed when you're in the South. Like the community has an expectation of that university. Yeah, they do. They do. And, and most HBCUs do. And that's because historically the HBCU was more than just the ivory tower. It was a place where the community could come in and get um, health and wellness checkups. It was a place where people could get guidance on documentation. You know, most folks were literate. Um, and so that bastion um, uh, called the HBCU that was sitting in the black um, area, um, it was more. And, you know, when I think about the presidents of that time, those were in studying history and, and the presidencies and leadership, those were the presidents who really laid the foundation for us. And if most of us returned back to that eye towards uh, being a part of the community, of the community, in the community, um, our tenures would be longer and probably a little more fulfilling. Uh, not that others aren't, but when you're in, you know, ingratiate yourself to the community, um, good things happen, you know, good yeah. things happen to you. So talk to us now about um, how you run your school. I think I don't know if we were on camera yet, recording or not, but you said that the students actually have your phone number. Oh, yeah. 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 Like, that's like a I, whole... I, Yeah, it's a whole thing, man. Like it, it, so you can't say that you, and this is just my own personal belief, and I watched Jimmy do it, President Jenkins. Um, you can't say you're about their development and not be accessible, right? You can't do that. And sometimes you can send one text message and open up um, access to something that they were having challenges with, right? Because humans are running these colleges um, and they come to work with challenges and funky attitudes and different dispositions. Uh, and they, you know, the kids come in with funky attitudes, different dispositions, and it's a recipe for disaster, you know? Um, and so sometimes you have to help them navigate the space. And I always use the problems that they come with me to help them navigate it without making things go away from them easy. So tell me what you did, right? Tell me what you did. You tell me what they did, what they didn't do, but tell me what you did. Now, be clear, we're going to take care of what, but let's talk about what you did and let's talk about how you could have handled that. Um, it has allowed me, you know, when a boiler goes out, um, on campus, I, I mean, I live on campus, but I have grace because the kids know me, right? So they're not going to be picketing. They're less likely to be upset. Um, and we still get some kids who are impatient and they want things when they want it. But I found grace because of um, what I do on the front end before anything happens. Um, and I think it's really important. And plus, you want to be inspired. And I was touched by my president. So why would I think for one second that I shouldn't be giving that same experience um, to all of the students who want it? Right. Reality is, is you know, we have you know, four bright scholars on our campus and we have kids who are late bloomers. And so some are going to, the dependent variable is the college. The independent variable is the student. And some are going to get through and some may only say, hey, and hello to me. And some may, you know, live in my office. It just depends. But yeah, they have access to me. Yeah, I, but, I working in higher ed, I, I went back for my master's because I said, oh, the students don't come into the career center, right? I need to go to them. And I thought, well, 
what inspired me in college? I was like my adjunct professor because he had real world experience and then he brought that to the classroom. I was like, I'm going to get my master's so I can be in the classroom. And they said, like, well, what class are you going to teach? I was like, oh, career research and development. They was like, that's like a one credit class, Winifred. Staff normally teaches that class. You'll never get in. You, you, you can't even find that class sometimes. I'm like, again, they don't know Winifred. I earned my master's because I wanted to get in the classroom to be an adjunct professor because I wanted to be where they were. There weren't any more yeah. leadership programs I could participate in because a lot of them were for students, but it had in small print staff too. So I would go and participate in those leadership programs and listen to the ones. Oh, but then like, hey, you ever come to the career center? You say you were looking for a job? Like we, we got warm yeah. And so I would always put myself where the students were. That's and I was a non-traditional student. And so that mm -hmm. was what inspired me to like, okay, I'm gonna go back because I want to go back. But I was like, oh, I want to be in the classroom because I want to be where yep. they are. Wow. Yep. Wow. Yep. So I am not only hearing, but really feeling from the power of you telling your own story, the the um the power that mentorship has had in your life. And and I'm I'm curious in your role now as a as a college president. Um do your students know you're dyslexic, you know, and, and for the ones who do, um, what is that experience like? I, I could just, you know, I've, I know that my life as a dyslexic has been so shaped by the people who I've met who could be sort of examples of excellence. Um, mm -hmm. But I also know, particularly when I was younger, they were few and far between, you know, so, yeah. and, and, and very few of them were folks like, yeah, like my college president that I could reach out to on Instagram, you know, like I was looking yeah. up to celebrities and that and that kind of thing. Um, apart from my classmates where, you know, we all knew we had similar sort of neural makeup and, and we're supporting yeah. each other. So what's what's it, you know, like what's the, the for, you know, like how out are you? And then, um, yeah, what's the experience you know, connecting with your, your students? You know, it's funny, Laderic, like, you know, initially, so I, I love suits, but I also love fitted caps and Jordans, right? So um, it's a mixed bag. Um, when you look at these kids, they're like, okay, we're waiting for the president. We don't know where he's at. This is always the synergy you can tell when you walk into the room with the freshmen for the first time. And when, you know, cause I'm intentional about sitting in the back or not acting, you know, and, and then introduced, you know, kids are like, oh, that's the, that's the president. So, and it never fails. When I tell them that I did not graduate from high school, I get their attention. And then when I tell them I'm dyslexic, it's like, Oh, so, you know, after that is all of you were way ahead of me when you came to college and there will be no excuse for not finishing way ahead of me, you know, so I, everybody on my campus knows uh, that I'm dyslexic. Um, it is a conversation where there's always there's always five, seven students that, you know, will reach out to me and say, I'm dyslexic. What tools do I need? These are what I've been exposed to. Can you tell me about accommodations, et cetera? Um, but everybody on the campus knows it. Everywhere I've been, I tell people, I'm, I'm no longer like after the Marine Corps, finding out that I wasn't like stupid, excuse me. I, it's a banner that I hold high now. Yeah. Wow. And can I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask. So I, I, I heard you in saying like you didn't utilize any disability supports when you were going through higher education. Um, I, I came out of high school, you know, just in a nutshell, my story, I came out of high school, my skills were very, very low. Um, and I was a part of a disability support program at a local uh, county college, community college. And I threw myself into that program. Any supports they wanted to provide, I said yes. Extra time, audio books, you know, and um, ended up getting you, a You're a smart man. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're a smart man. <laughs> but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm connecting with your story because I also, like, I was aware that I, 
I had these supports, but I was still going above and beyond. I was working 10 you times knew. harder than everybody. Yeah. Else. Yeah. The audio books and listening to things over again and recording lectures and listening to those. And I also remember um, I was a mathematics major and I remember going through, I guess it was calculus and um, finding every professor that taught a section of calculus. And so I went to the class that I was assigned, but then I would go to another professor's class and say, look, I've paid for the class. I'm in such and such a course. I just want to hear this material delivered again in a different way from someone else. And that was, you mm -hmm. know, it was just over and over and over again. Um, and I think that um, for many of us, there's sort of just like a brute force solution to trying to, you know, to get, to get through some of these challenges. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I utilize, I utilize a lot of those supports. So I'm, I'm curious, um, what are, what are disability supports look like at your college? Well, because it's something that I'm sensitive to, we have the full gamut. Um, okay. You know, we have counselors um, that um, help with the, we have a testing center that is staffed by a counselor or a um, professional who is um, capable of looking at um, spelling, grammar, uh, ability to read, auditory skills, um, phonological uh, skills. Uh, and so we have that. They have the accommodations, the testing accommodations, you name it. Uh, and our professors are really kind. So they know that we, at least I, don't believe in, in leaving anybody behind. Um, and so we try to mimic that behavior on the campus. You know, we we are going to do everything that we can to help you, provided you're helping yourself. So, Dr. Felton, I just want you to know, we get a lot of parents that listen to this podcast. Mm -hmm. and the next step, after they get all the tutoring, after they go, some of them who are fortunate enough to go to a specialized dyslexia school, the next stage is a college and university. And the parents that are listening, they have heard you say, Students have your phone number. They have heard you say that you are sensitive to that. I just want you to know when when the sure. things start rolling in and these parents start reaching out saying, wait a minute, this college yeah. president is dyslexic. And, and, it's, and it's historically black too? What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm it's just real. Like, I'm putting that out there because that is such a huge concern because a lot of the college professors are not aware right? Accommodations in college look different than high school. Uh, in college, you have to self-advocate. You have to, you know, self-disclose. And as you yeah. said, you didn't want to. And we get a lot of students who will get the help in high school, right? But then when they go to college, they want to be normal. And as my daughter said, normal isn't real, but then they don't want to ask for help. But then I'm sitting here listening to you say that when incoming freshmen come in, you tell them, I didn't finish high school and I'm dyslexic. So the college president is opening up that door for someone to yeah. say, I'm struggling too, or I struggle. That is amazing. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. Yeah. I think what we have to do, like, you know, with these students, I mean, because, I mean, can you imagine coming up in their age right now, the, the mess that they've got to deal with? Right. And uh, as, as an 18 year old, you're trying to figure out who you are. Um, you're trying to figure out this thing called life. And then you have these societal cultural wars and, you know, blatant racism that you have to navigate um, and uh, caste, capitalism, all of these, uh, the meritocracy, uh, all these things that really uh, are designed um, to annihilate you. So you've got to manage that. And now we're asking you to be your best academically. And then in the middle, you got to look fresh because there's, you know, some sisters over here or some brothers <laughs> over there. Like it, it's a lot that you're asking kids, right? <laughs> so if you can take off that one weight of saying, look, there is help for you. It is not okay. Um, to say you're okay when you're not, um, then that gives kids the license to be free um, and to uh, 
to really remove that burden at least. Um, and I, so, so I think their chances of, of succeeding are far better if they know that they're in a space where support is there and waiting for them. Wow. Wow. Do you have any of the staff that come and tell you and talk to you who, who may themselves be neurodivergent? Um, there has been, since I've been there the five, six years, there's probably been two or three that have said something. I still think that it's taboo. It's like even counseling is taboo in our space, right? In the black community. And it's still, um, I think it's still taboo to say, look, I'm dyslexic uh, because most people think that it's uh, on the spectrum of autism. Like, uh, you know, uh, trying to get people to understand the difference between the two is really not worth the time, number one. Uh, but I think there are some impediments, internal impediments that, for whatever reason, preclude people from being as boisterous as I am about, you know, being dyslexic. I don't care who you are. Um, I, I will tell you, I don't care if I'm in the White House or in a Fortune 500 company. Um, I'm going to walk in there. I might use some improper grammar. I don't I, I don't care um, about what you think about me because I'm acutely aware of who I am. Um, and, you know, these, as your daughter says, normal is not real. Um, and so that's the world that I live in. I don't care what your prescribed um, notions, uh, standards are as it relates to superficial stuff. I could care less. Um, so I'm, I'm with my kids. Um, and when I say my kids, I'm possessive about two things, uh, my students and my institution. Um, and uh, when I'm with them, I want them to see an authentic version of me. They get to, you know, hear me listening to trap music or R&B or country, but mostly gospel. But they also get to see me um, talking about, you know, my favorite athletic teams and what's going on in the world. And then they get to see me buttoned up, right? And so it is important for them to understand that there's no mold. You created yourself. You know, there's no mold. And I'm not a theologian, but I often remind them of the potter. And each of us uh, will be different. And um, so embrace that. Wow. Wow. I'm a... <laughs> I, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap us up, but I do just want to say that like it is very clear. I can hear the presence of your faith in in the way oh, you're, man. You know, you're sharing your story and your experience. Yeah. And I think I think it has been one of the more refreshing aspects of being uh, one of the hosts of this podcast and having these conversations within and for the Black community. Is every so often I am just sort of reminded. Um, both of the the presence that Grace have had has had in my life but also just how, how much many of us lean on our faith to get through some tremendously challenging times. So I don't know if you, if you just want to speak on that at all. Yeah. So as a kid, mom would put us on a bus and we would go to church. Um, then, you know, puberty hit me and I was like, I ain't going to church. Um, <laughs> but I had, by that time, the, you know, it was already done. I, I knew so many hymns, um, uh, you know, I knew who Jesus was. Um, and so while I, you know, strayed away from the church uh, at 18, just to make it to 18, um, I actually was shot in the back of my shoulder. Um, and I, I mean, having been in the streets um, and to made that journey without a felony, which would have stopped me from going in the Marine Corps. Like there's no other way to explain where I am today. And, you know, I've had some trials and tribulations. Um, it's been rough. I remember, you know, the days of the cash register two-step. Um, Y'all are too young uh, to remember that, but that's when you give your little, debit card and your credit or your credit card or whatever you had back in the day it was a little you know little card and you look at the amount of stuff you have at the register and you're just 
you know, two stepping from side to side, hoping that it's going to go through. Um, uh, that's what that is. That I, no, I did. I'm I'm doing well now, brother. But I remember doing that yeah, dance. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I I know I know you probably did, but it's just probably named something different. But that mm-hmm. cash register two step, you know, going from pulling up to the tire store and getting two used tires and rotating the good ones off the back and putting, you know, I go from that to being. I mean, there's no other way to explain. My mom had a seventh grade education. We grew up in poverty, abject poverty. Well, I won't say abject poverty, but inner city poverty. Um, She needed food stamps and that welfare check. But she wasn't a lazy person. She worked a full-time job and a part-time job, six days a week. Never saw her take a day off. When my family made it out of the projects, none of my sisters were pregnant. All of us went to school and were good, good kids. If I was aware of God's presence, then I would have, you know, praised him in, in a major way. But to get out of the Marine Corps, go to the post office and to be touched by angels all along the journey it has been a securitous path ups and downs tosses and turns um and to be where i'm at now the president of a two-time president Mm. of historically black colleges like with a phd and a law degree and dyslexic like there's no other way to explain where I am other than saying that God is everything. And, you know, our faith continues to grow. You walk in it daily, you stumble, you get back on the high horse because you know that he is the one person, regardless of any other person, regardless of what you've done, he is the one person that will allow you to lay in the bosom uh, and and to feel the warmth of his smile. I know that God has that waiting for me every day. And as a result of that, I know that I have to walk around with grace. I know that I have to give grace, a lot of it, because it's been given to me. Um, And, you know, I'm still trying to figure faith out and, you know, I I remember I'm starting back up to get a master's in theology from SMU. And I remember this entrance exam. They're asking, what do you want to learn or take away most? And so I wrote this paper on understanding grace. Like, how does that work? Why is grace what it is? You know, and it's probably an elementary uh, desire. But I have been blessed with so much and there's so much grace that follows me. You know, my wife is the, probably one of the most gracious human beings because of the grace that she gives me and my family. And it's just so amazing. So we walk in what our mama taught us. And so and then leading a distressed asset. Some HBCUs have challenges um, and that work can be daunting, but if you don't have faith, it can drive you crazy. So it's everywhere in my life. You can just see particles of my my faith uh, in all the work that I do and everything that I do. So it is, you know, it's everything. Well, there, Winifred, yeah. it is, it's everything to me. My faith is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you've been a, you've been a blessing to this episode of the Black and Dyslexic Podcast. If folks want to learn more about you, connect with you, learn more about Wiley College, can you, um, you know, the URL and kind of, kind of handles you want to put out? Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram at H Felton, H F E L T O N eighty seven eleven. Twitter is at Herman Felton. Facebook is Herman J. Felton Jr. LinkedIn, the same thing. And 
My email address is the word 17, S E V E N T E E N, at Wiley C, W I L E Y C dot edu, 17 at Wiley C dot edu. And when they become students, they'll get my cell phone number too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and just to close this out, and, and um, one of the things we pride ourselves in is making sure that we pull as many resources and points kind of made throughout our episode and put them in the show notes. So if folks didn't get all that, we'll, we'll make a point to put everything in the show notes so they can look down there in the, in the, uh, the show description to be able to pull that up. Just, just lastly, you've given, you've given out a lot of uh, advice already, but for the young dyslexics that are listening, maybe in high school, maybe they're that, that person that didn't finish high school yeah. and they're trying to figure out kind of what's next. Um, can you give one piece of advice for, for those young dyslexics? Embrace your superpower. All of us who are dyslexic have superpowers. I, I will go to my grave believing that. Tell someone if you're challenged, if you're struggling, don't wait. The world won't come down crashing. Uh, no one will think less of you. But there's so many blessings and affirmations that will be given to you once you are diagnosed as a dyslexic. Um, it's a special community to be in. And uh, you should know that you're probably smarter than everybody you're around. So go, uh, go get help. Don't wait. Oh, man, that was great. That was great. Well, there you have it, guys. Dr. Herman Felton, president and CEO of Wiley College in Marshall, Texas. Can I say one last thing? Sure. I think it's... I think it's really important to give you all your flowers. You don't get paid to do this stuff. It's thankless work. But yet you are what I call void fillers. People run to gaps and fill them. And, and that's what this work is, right? It's thankless, um, but it is extremely important. Folks uh, don't know, you know, how dams continue to hold water. And that's because somebody's constantly filling uh, those gaps and those voids. And this is a silent epidemic. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, people, there's so many of us that are impacted and particularly in the Black community. Uh, and we don't have the resources. Um, and so um, there's a young lady down in, in Florida, Jennifer Knopp, um, who has a foundation that works with uh, dyslexia folk. And uh, she's done some amazing things and brought some uh, an awareness to it. And I just have, uh, I think there's a special corner in, in heaven for you all uh, for doing this work. Um, and, and so I'm grateful and I'm glad that we were able to connect. And I'm so appreciative that you uh, thought of me to be on this show. So Lederick, Winifred, Thank you for the work that you do. And you guys are our superheroes. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so oh, much. oh, hold on, Winifred. So yes, we do this for free. And but the the idea to kick this off really came from Winifred. And so everyone can listen to these episodes free of charge, but Winifred does have a nonprofit. And check me out, Dr. Felton. I'm a, this is my development hat here. If folks yes, want to be able to donate, if they want to yes, donate sir. to your nonprofit, Winifred. Can you give them uh, where they need to go online to be able to, to make that donation? Sure, sure. They can find us at www.soallcanread.org and just go to donations and you can click on our foundation, which has been verified and confirmed, and it goes through PayPal and then that money will come to us and you get an automatic letter that you can use for your taxes to get your write-off. So um, awesome. you can go to www.soallcanread.org. All right. Awesome. All right. Why don't you close this out? Blessings to y'all. Tune in next week, where we'll continue to bring you lived experiences and more unfiltered conversations with experts in the field around all things Black and dyslexic. Make sure you subscribe and follow the Black and Dyslexic podcast 
where we educate, empower, and equip Black and underrepresented minorities. The Black and Dyslexic Podcast is partially funded by Morgan Cares and the Center for Urban Health Disparities Research and Innovation, awarded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. The Black and Dyslexic Podcast is sponsored by Dyslexia Advocation Incorporated, a 501c3 charitable organization located in Baltimore City, Maryland, whose mission is to equip parents of children with dyslexia and other language-based learning disabilities with the necessary tools to help their children become successful readers. You can find them on the web at www.soallcanread.org.